Hello, I'm Andy Rominger. I'm a postdoctoral fellow at the Santa Fe Institute, and today we're going to be taking a deeper dive into phylogenetics. Specifically, we're going to be talking about how to statistically infer a phylogeny from data on species living in the present, organisms living in the present, and why the deep past is so difficult to infer from this contemporary data. And Professor Kachar already gave us a great overview of how to use phylogenies to travel through time and infer the past. So in this lecture, I want to specifically go into more detail on the actual inference process. How do we estimate a phylogeny from the data at hand? So the goal of this is to find the evolutionary process leading to the data we have. And the data we have tends to be homologous regions of DNA. Homologous means this part of the genome of different organisms does the same thing, has the same function, has the same, most importantly, has the same evolutionary origin. So these are comparing apples to apples, comparing the same region of genomes of different organisms. And the process we're talking about is the process of speciation, of extinction, and of the passing on of genetic information to daughter lineages from ancestral lineages. And this process also involves mutation, most importantly actually involves mutation because the changes in DNA are what allow us to infer the past. So we have typically a rate matrix, a matrix of transition rates between different base pairs. When one base pair goes to another, that's a mutation. So A to C, A to G, A to T. All of these can have different rates or they can have the same rates. It depends on the model of this process that we're using. So we have transition rates, we have a topology, which is the connections of the phylogeny, and then we have the sequence data. And our, what we can do with this is we can write a mathematical expression for the probability of the sequence data conditional on the transition rates and the topology. This conditional probability is called the likelihood, and our goal in statistical inference is to find the combinations of transition rates and the combinations of topologies that maximize this likelihood. So this particular inference procedure is called maximum likelihood inference. And once we've found the different, the specific different transition matrix and topology that maximizes the likelihood, that gives us our estimate of the phylogeny. So I've created a very simplified version of this. I've got different topologies on one axis and different transition rates on the other axis with likelihood coming up the Z axis. In reality, you can imagine topologies are not a simple one dimensional axis. They're a complicated web of different choices and what nodes connect to which. And so traversing this space can be very challenging. And for that reason, one of the alternatives to maximum likelihood inference is Bayesian inference, which still uses the likelihood as a critical part of inferring what's the most probable phylogeny and transition rate matrix to describe the data but it has a different algorithm for moving through this space of different topologies and different transition rates that's more conducive to the complexity of the space. So Bayesian inference is something that very commonly is used in phylogenetic estimation. Two other methods that were used very much historically but are used less commonly now because likelihood and Bayesian methods uh, are more preferred but these other two methods, parsimony and distance-based inference, are still used and there's information on them in the further reading section if you're curious about what those methods are. There's also more information about likelihood and Bayesian inference methods. So now we start talking about all the reasons why this inference process is very difficult, especially when we're trying to infer the deep past. So the first caveat is that after we've maximized this likelihood or traversed this space with a Bayesian algorithm to try to find 
uh, the best hypothesis for the phylogeny given the data. What we're left with is not actually the kind of phylogeny that we would typically think of. Most of the methods and algorithms we have in, give us what's called an unrooted phylogeny, which is what this kind of more spidery branching phylogeny is uh, in the corner. So these phylogenies have, these unrooted phylogenies have no directionality of time. We don't know where the ancestor is and how that ancestor has, has led to the present tips. This is why in famous trees like the Banfield Tree of Life, there's kind of this radial bran branching circular diagram. There's no actual root. There's no actual last universal common ancestor indicated in these phylogenies because it's very difficult to know, especially in the case where we're trying to infer a phylogeny of all life on Earth. And the reason why that's hard when we're trying to infer all life on Earth is that the best method we have for doing this is using something called an outgroup. So an outgroup is how we typically find the root of a phylogeny or the, com the last common ancestor of a phylogeny. And an outgroup, for example, if I have these three mammals, I have a human, a squirrel, and a cat, I could choose an outgroup that's completely different from all these. So for example, I could choose a bird. When we're trying to do all of life as we know it, there's no outgroup for that. But in this case, we have an outgroup, we have a bird. And now where that bird connects, to this topology of these three mammals shown that where it connects is shown in yellow that's the common ancestor of those mammals because those mammals had to find a common ancestor before they can go and branch off from whatever the common ancestor was of birds and mammals and so now finding that root then gives a temporal directionality to the tree we now know where the, tree, where the tree of mammals starts. It starts at this common ancestor and it flows to the tips. Now, another common problem, common difficulty, is that the methods we use to infer phylogenies don't actually have an explicit linear time in them. They have time in terms of substitutions, in terms of mutation events, and because mutation rates vary across different lineages and across different periods in Earth's history, this, these mutation events don't tell us strictly the time on each branch. So these branches, for example, are measured in units of substitutions, not in units of time. Again, when we look at something like the Banfield Tree of Life, the branches don't all line up at one point, which is the, the current era. They're at variable distances, and that's because we measure their lengths in terms of substitution events. So in order to scale this tree with substitution event branch lengths into, tempor into branch lengths that represent true time, we need additional information. For example, we need fossils from the fossil record telling us when these common ancestors live. Or there are also cases where we might know to very great accuracy what the mutation rate is of a specific group of organisms, in which case we can use that mutation rate as almost like a clock to infer the, the depth of different branches. Another caveat, especially when we're dealing with very deep time phylogenetic relationships, is that the longer different lineages have been evolving on separate trajectories, the more time there has been for mutations, which happen continuously, the more time there is for these mutations to accrue. And these very divergent sequences can actually accidentally end up looking convergent, so they can convergently evolve towards similar sequences by accident, or they can evolve towards such divergent sequences that they look nothing like any of the other specimen, any of the other species we have in the phylogeny. And so our inference methods, our statistical methods, tend to cluster these long branches together. So we say long branches attract each other. In this example phylogeny, we have a very long branch at the bottom, 
and its sequence is so divergent from the rest that it's unclear if we should put this at the root of the phylogeny or sister with this other lineage that has a long branch or sister with this other lineage that has a long branch. So that genetic information has been lost because of the deep time and all of the mutations that have accrued in this lineage. So we'll add long branch attraction to our list of caveats. And then finally, thinking especially about the last universal common ancestor, Luca. One of the great challenges in, in inferring these deep phylogenetic relationships is that there's been billions of years of evolution. For example, from the bacterial genome, a single circular plastid, to the human genome, many chromosomes with many, many genes. So what information, what genetic information is still shared in common between these incredibly different types of organisms. It turns out that all of life on Earth, all of life as we know it, needs to transcribe information and DNA into proteins. And all of life as we know it uses ribosomes to achieve that. Therefore, the genes that encode for ribosomal RNA and ribosomal proteins are exactly the genes that we can use to infer these deep phylogenetic relationships because that is specifically the genetic information that is shared and conserved among all life forms on earth, all life as we know it. So with that, I'll say that given all these caveats, it's incredible that different research groups have been able to reconstruct such detailed phylogenies for life on earth. And many of those phylogenies are indeed robust to all these different caveats because they've gone to great lengths to overcome these challenges. So just whenever you're looking at phylogenies, you can think about this is the process that the researchers used to arrive at that hypothesis, that hypothesized phylogeny. And these are some of the pitfalls to look out for and see if the researchers have confronted them appropriately.